This is Coffee Country and Cody. Cody. Hello and welcome in here from the Acuff House Studio on the Grand Ole Opry Plaza where Kelly Sutton was just a few hours ago and she decided to sleep in this morning. Relax. Good for her. Tyler Mahan Co. is coming to see us. I am very excited about this interview, this sit down, this podcast. Anybody know who the first Cocaine and Rhinestones podcast was? All right. The first two. Uh, I, I can tell you number two, because that's the first one I ever listened to. It was Loretta Lynn and the Pill. That's right. number two. Yeah. yeah. Fascin- fascinating podcast. Number yeah. one, uh, this person duetted with Loretta Lynn in the early years. Uh, oh, so not Conway. No. Uh, oh. Think, um, think about it, darling. Um, Be better to your neighbors and you'll have better oh, neighbors. Oh, Ern- 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 Ernest Tubb. Doggone, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yes. it was. Well, Tyler, uh, <laughs> I can't wait to share his social media open this morning that I read. Uh-huh. It's perfect for us because it involves us. But uh, he'll be at the Country Music Hall of Fame's Ford Theater on Saturday the 14th for a book talk with the Hall of Fame's Allison Moore. Yes, artist Allison Moore now at the Hall of Fame. And uh, Freedom Museum members, book signing and reception to follow. There is so much to get caught up. We just really don't have enough time to do it justice. But we're going to give it a shot in the time we do have. That's Tyler Mahan Co. Straight ahead on Coffee, Country, and Cody. This is Coffee, Country, and Cody. Ready this for a made in Tennessee road trip? Let me tell you where to go. TNTrailsAndByways.com. Get off the beaten path and take the scenic route. Maybe you'll wind up on the Walking Tall Trail. Southwest Tennessee, Buford Pusser country, mm-hmm. rockabilly, rails, and legendary trails. Explore charming small towns, mom and pop eateries, courthouse squares. That's something you always enjoy, oh, Charlie. Big the on the courthouse square. square. And yeah. barbecue gems down in Southwest Tennessee. You know, if you uh, go to tntrailsandbyways.com, each trail has its own dedicated pages. And you can search by whatever you're interested in. You can do food and beverage. You can do historic sites. You can do fun things for kids. And each trail has easily over 100 st- things to do. I happen to live on the Jack Trail. No, I did not buy my home specifically because it was on the Jack Trail. But I will say it is rather appropriate product placement. Uh, but just 108 stops there. And if you spend even five or 10 minutes on the website, you will come up with dozens and dozens of great ideas for a day trip, a weekend getaway, or if you come into town for a couple of weeks on vacation, it's indispensable. And I live on the Ring of Fire Trail. You do? Mm-hmm. And it is the time of year when fire curing tobacco, dark fired tobacco, mm-hmm. uh, is, is the way we roll in Robertson County, Tennessee. And that's going on as we speak. Mm-hmm. And so much more. Charlie mentioned uh, a couple of things there that I wanted to follow up on, and that's there are a total of 16 trails. And when he talked about those hundreds of things to do on each trail, 1,351 recommended stops if you get the travel guide at tntrailsandbyways.com. We welcome Tyler Mahan Co. to Coffee Country and Cody. Very excited for this. Host of an incredibly popular podcast, Cocaine and Rhinestones, which started, what year did you start it? I think it started in 2017. Not, I'm not super good at keeping track of dates. That's what I like had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Ernest Tubb and Loretta Lynn. Yeah, I knew it was important to start off with some stories about them. And why, E.T., I'm curious, just of all the people you could have chosen from that golden age. Well, I didn't know much about podcasts and I didn't go into this with much of a plan, but I sort of looked at what everyone else was doing in podcasts and I found out that true crime was one of the most popular genres of podcasts and I figured I knew some stories that might cross over into that area and, uh, you know, Ernest Tubb deciding some guy might need to get shot was a, <laughs> I thought, a pretty good entry point to the history of country music. Yeah. And he'd fire the whole band when he'd start drinking. And then oh, they'd I mean, all hitchhike to the next truck stop and he'd stop and rehire them. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people who think that just because they listen to that episode, they know everything there is to know about Ernest Tubb. That's just a story. I didn't, I didn't tell all of them. <laughs> Well, at, at some point, didn't the tornado really, uh, the East Nashville tornadoes of 2020 kind of catapult you into this really picking up steam with your podcasts? Uh, well, that was that happened around the time that uh, I was working on season two, and it was kind of a scary time because there was that. There was a lot of political unrest in our city. Someone decided to set our courthouse on fire. And I lived in a pretty rough neighborhood. So uh, I was sort of sequestered at home working on the second season, which is what became this book, 
now eventually. Yeah, and, and then uh, we had the pandemic that set in right after yeah, that. Yeah, that too. Within yeah. a month. So it was like, hey, stay home and listen to George Jones until four o'clock in the morning every night by yourself. <laughs> we'll worry about your mental health later. Well, he, Tyler, he's a fascinating character because not only is you know the episode with George and Tammy the basis for this book, but he's kind of the gift that keeps giving because he has resurfaced in several episodes, and we kind of you know close his story with one of the more recent ones as well. He's he's just a fascinating guy with with like so many layers. Yeah, and that's kind of why I decided to tackle his story on the podcast. As you know, there are not very many artists in country music history who have had more than one book written mm-hmm. about them. And George Jones is one of those characters, but sort of the running theme through a lot of those books is the person not being able to understand him, you mm-hmm. know, not really being able to figure out how can this guy sing such incredibly moving songs and seem to not have anything to say to me, you know, yeah. in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it, I was just like kind of, I don't know, kind of tired of reading someone failing to get at the core of George Jones. I figured I'd give it a shot, you know. Well, the Leuven Brothers episode is entitled Running Wild, if you go to the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Merle Haggard, this was when you got into season two, Bobby Gentry. There's a mysterious story, isn't it? Also, yeah, we got a lot of those in country history, as a matter yeah, of fact. She just disappeared. She did it on purpose, too. A lot of people do it against their will. but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Spade Cooley's story, which is just, you talk about true crime. That was horrific for me. That was actually the first episode of the podcast that I made. So that one took me the longest of the first season because I was learning how to do everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stuff that I would do differently now, a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. that I know how to do it the right way. But I, and I could have just gone back and made that episode again, but I didn't want to, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want to go back and say all that stuff into a microphone again. I was having nightmares with him in them just really truly horrific stuff uh and then at the beginning of that episode there's some trigger warnings you know and then i tell you there's going to be a point in this episode where i tell you if you're not sure you can handle this just fast forward it and a lot of people think they're tough you know i can take it and then they wish they hadn't listened to everything (laughs) yeah there's a reason i'm giving you this advice yeah Yeah. i don't i mean i don't take stuff like that lightly Mm -hmm. i tend to Mm -hmm. trust people to figure out for themselves Mm -hmm. but on that one i felt Mm -hmm. You could use a little warning. So how was it taking uh, an episode that is about 60, 70 minutes or so? I love the little history lessons, by the way, that precede some of the episodes. They're fascinating stuff. Uh, and expanding it into a, into a book. I mean, it's quite an endeavor. Well, George and Tammy are central to the whole second season. Yeah. So, And there's a lot of non-musical history that gets mm-hmm. woven into it as well. Yep. Um, stuff about the Protestant Reformation. That's what I found fascinating. Yeah, and, I loved uh, it. Yeah. Sort of... Uh, uh, history of how modern Spanish bullfighting came into Mm -hmm. existence. It sounds kind of unusual, but as soon as you open the book, it's the first picture you see. It's uh, a a bullfighting scene. Mm -hmm. And I I think that um, particularly when it comes to the fashion, you really can't ignore something like Spanish bullfighting. If you really want to understand country history and the culture around country music and fashion is a huge part of that. I don't think we get to rhinestone suits as we know them without the outfits that sure. Spanish bullfighters were wearing. And of course, the culture that created bullfighting is a ranching culture, which got exported to the Americas with colonization. And what we think of as the American West is really a lot of tradition that started in mm-hmm. Spain. And there are illustrations throughout, including the cover design that, that folks are seeing now. Give a shout out to the illustrator. Oh, Oh, Wayne White is incredible. If y'all don't know the name off the top of your head, he did the set design on Pee Wee's Playhouse back in the day. Very formative uh-huh. to my own youth. Um, he's done a lot of work on music videos, the Smashing Pumpkins Tonight Tonight video, I believe Big Time, Peter Gabriel. Oh, wow. Um, and he's just a really fantastic artist. He became a fan of the first season of the podcast and he started doing these drawings of country artists while listening to the show and just uploading them to Instagram <laughs> with the hashtag cocaine and rhinestones. And I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. This guy's so, just... <laughs> why cocaine and rhinestones and not cold beer and rhinestones? 
Uh, was I, there I mean, a particular individual who precipitated that? That absolutely could have worked. Um, <laughs> it's sort of a shorthand reference to a lot of ideas that folks get about country music and what makes it real, what what makes it raw, and why they like it more than other genres of music. And a lot of those ideas are kind of silly when you really put a spotlight on them. And I think getting rid of those ideas and looking at what's really going on is far more interesting and even magical and mythical than believing these silly notions. So Mm -hmm. with cocaine, it's sort of shorthand for the tendency to romanticize substance abuse and addiction when, you know, the reality is the people who are dealing with these things don't think of themselves as rock stars because they're addicted to drugs, you know? And then rhinestones is sort of shorthand for thinking you can just put on a suit and now you're a country singer, you know? It's not (laughs) not how it works, man. (laughs) One for each, uh, things you learned that you took away from doing research on George Jones and Tammy Wynette. Well, what surprised you me... You didn't know before. The, yeah, what surprised me the most was almost everything to do with Tammy Wynette's uh, personal life. I was, of course, familiar with the music and a, a lot of the big picture, broad strokes that people know. But once you get into, um, especially building a timeline of, okay, here's what her life was like at the time and here's what all the newspaper articles about were about at the time Mm -hmm. and this stuff is completely mind-blowing just the i mean she faked her own kidnapping i remember uh vividly has anyone else with a grammy award ever done that (laughs) (laughs) anything on jones that you learned that we Uh, i mean honestly not too surprising there you know like i I kind of nothing to see here please go back to your home yeah well his his personal life was so much of what people loved about the story and then tammy's personal life was what a lot of the fans kind of would rather not talk about you know Mm -hmm. which i guess is why i knew so much more about jones than her Hmm. Tyler Mahan Co. Co. is here. It's uh, it's Cocaine and Rhinestones, a history of George Jones and Tammy Wynette. His first ever book, Simon & Schuster. He'll be at the Country Music Hall of Fame's Ford Theater on Saturday the 14th. He's got a book talk schedule with the Hall of Fame's Allison Moore, an artist in her own right. And Freedom Museum members, book signing and reception to follow. Before we wrap up, we, we obviously are in our brand new Acuff House studio. Yeah. Tyler sent a great photo this morning that I, I want everybody to be able to see and you will describe. Uh, this goes back to late 1980s, Tyler? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> probably 89 or so. Uh, my father was still signed to Epic at the time, produced by Billy Sherrill, who was also George and Tammy's producer. And we were backstage at uh, Grand Ole Opry and Nashville now quite a bit. And that's us with Roy Acuff. I'm on the ground there. My mom's holding my sister Tanya and my father's holding my sister Cheyenne. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. And thanks for getting up early and coming in. I was reading on your socials, uh, see if I can find it here in closing, uh, where you talked about, did something like 12 radio interviews in two hours this morning. This was yesterday. Drank four cups of coffee, six donuts, uh, I can see the curvature of the universe with my naked eye. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was pretty wired yesterday. I was in the zone, man. <laughs> Going to be live on WSM Radio and Circle TV tomorrow morning, meeting this morning. And yes, uh-huh. it has come and gone off to your next. Um, yeah, thanks for having yeah. me. Ready right. to keep going. And You're there's an audio. you dressed man, too, yeah. by the oh, way. Oh, yeah. And there's an audio version as well for folks who like to listen and read as they drive, right? Of so, course, yeah. yes, always. That's country couture. And while she will always be... Deep down inside, country couture. She has got more glitz and and, and glamour than Las Vegas can handle on any given day. (laughs) I don't know how you make that True story. True story. I like that. It is great to see you, Callie. Callie Tucker (laughs) Good to see you. It's good to be back. Uh, We went back. It's been a decade, and it was right before you moved to Las Vegas, where you spent the previous 10 years. That's right. So get us caught up a little bit on what's happening in Vegas. Man, uh, Vegas has been so good to me since the second I moved there. And why Vegas? You know, okay, so when I was on The Voice season six. Because you were six, here. Home yes, was Nashville. Yes, this is home correct? base. Yeah, yeah, I grew up here. Grew up in Nashville. After I was on The Voice, um, my battle partner, Ryan White Maloney, was my, my, my battle partner. We became best friends. Probably the greatest thing I ever got out of the show was just the amazing friendships. But um, 
he was like, why don't you move to Vegas and start performing? He's like, I think you would do really well. And I got, kind of felt like I needed a change, you know, been, been here my whole life, needed an, another perspective on what the world had to offer. And it was, it took me three, I, I mean, I immediately kind of decided and I was three months I was there, so I actually had my you know ten year anniversary October fourteenth, moving to Las Vegas. What was your first gig out there? Yeah, it was a lot of networking in the beginning, but yeah. uh, people, you know, you go in and you just kind of like, hey, Callie, they would invite me, like you know, Ryan connected me with a ton of ton of people, so he gets so much credit for for my transition there. But he introduced me to a lot of people that was like, hey, come sit on this uh, the set and do a couple songs, and come over here and do on this set. And then Ryan and I wound up performing. Um, three nights a week at Sunset Station, which is um, a station casino's property. And we worked together on that. And then it kind of slowly, I mean, people, I would get emails and phone calls to be, to do my thing. And finally I started per per performing solo completely, um, singing to tracks. So I'm a track singer in Las Vegas. I don't use any bands. I'm completely self-sufficient. And I think that there's a there might be a, a little bit of a stigma at, to, attached to that, but if you were to come to the shows, you would understand how incredible and amazing it is. It's so much fun, and I, you know, I got I can I can control the room. It's pretty pretty neat. <laughs> I don't know I don't know how else to explain it, but and you and Charlie were just talking off the air. The room happens to be at Resorts World. <laughs> one of the well, one, one of, of yeah. one of the many ones. I've, I'm at Aria. I'm at the I'm at the Wynn. I'm at Resorts World, and then I do a lot of. Um, uh, local venues throughout Summerlin and, and Henderson in Las Vegas. So, yeah, I've, I've, it's been so good to me. Everybody there is so wonderful. I have such a great fan base and, and family and community. I, I absolutely love it. Do you find that, and I love it. I've only been a couple of times. And yeah. I, like uh, Times Square is one of my favorite places. And the strip to me is three miles of Times Square. Right. So I, yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. But there's very little in between. You either love it or it's not for you. And were you a little worried when you went out there first? Or did you instantly love no, it? No, I instantly loved it. Yeah. I actually felt uh, every time I would get to go down on the strip, I was in awe of it. Uh -huh. Just complete, just magic. You know, I, I'm, the, I'm the kind of person that's just like, I, I see magic in everything. And I just yeah. absorb it. I'm like, I'm in the moment of how special this is well when you're coming into town and you pass the vegas the historic vegas sign yep. and it says frank sinatra boulevard there is something about that right well, I, and i'm not there to do what you do yeah i'm there to host or do those sorts of things radio yeah. and tv related in country music i'm there to eat and lose money but you know <laughs> vegas likes me better but there uh, is something about seeing those names of the yeah. rat pack yeah. and you Go ahead. No, I say that all the time where I'm like, okay, what I'm doing there in Las Vegas is just, I'm, I'm just following in the footsteps of these, of, of the great, you know, lounge singers from, you know, Dean Martin, the, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Sammy Jr. Davis Jr. I just love that I'm just, I'm like following in those same footsteps. It's, it's, a, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's not lost on me. Like I just, I'm just so in awe of it. Every time I get to do it, it's it's huge. Have you seen Carrie Underwood out there? I rarely get to go to shows because I'm always playing my own. I literally play six nights a week. Do you? No kidding. Uh, it's yeah. I get. And see, I've heard that that grind is what turns a lot of people off about Vegas artists. Is they, I mean, particularly you, if they either want to work or you don't. But I mean, like I love what I do and I love the venues that I'm at. I am more I am more particular now mm -hmm. because I can be about where I'm playing mm -hmm. and like be very choosy and like you know okay. I want to be happy wherever I'm at. I want to have a good crowd wherever I'm at. You know, like. What about Tanya Tucker's Tequila Cantina on Lower Broadway in Nashville? Have I you, heard. Have I didn't, you played? No, but is it is it was it a pop up or was it is it, is it a? It's a pop. It was a pop. up Oh, see, yeah. I wasn't yeah. here, yeah. so I, I didn't get to. But I did see it. I would have loved to have gone. Dang. <laughs> she, no, listen. Like our family needs to open up a taco restaurant, a mm. Mexican restaurant. My mom and her make the best tacos on the planet. My aunt Tanya taught me how to make coleslaw. So they were raised in Arizona, right? Well, is Tanya, te well, te Tanya, Texas? It, there was Arizona, and they also had a stint in Henderson, Nevada. So, oh, wow. yeah, they lived there. And then, of course, here with here, the success yeah. that she enjoyed yeah. with Billy Sherrill in the area. Yeah, day. I think their I think their 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 roots in the in the food was definitely probably like you said, Arizona and Texas, like that. It's and, a Mm. I'm 16 years old in 1974, and your mom is in her early 20s, and she, uh, along with your aunt, yeah. Tanya, has got a song called Get On My Love Train and Ride. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a big issue. She was on. Baby, my love train's coming. Do it, girl. It's really on fire and I mean, 
Got a special seat that I've saved just for you. Okay, we'll go. I was telling Love Andy, that song. Yeah. Andy, this morning, knowing you were coming, I said I had the biggest crush on her mama. <laughs> get, a, get, a, get a number. Yeah, yeah. everybody did. So everybody catch did. us up on her. We would be remiss if you oh, get away and we so didn't. So I'm excited to tell you. So um, with the projects I'm doing from Country Couture, Urban Cowboy, and then um, my uh, single I'm releasing next year, it's called Last Name. Um, she is in every single music video. My mom mm -hmm. is featured in every single one of them. Because <laughs> I wanted to include her, because she's like obviously the re like huge, a big reason why I do what I do. So it is so special to include her in, in all this. So she makes cameos in every single video. So she's doing really well. She's back out here in Nashville, and um, you know I'm just flip-flopping back and forth, Vegas to Nashville. That's... It's what we do. So you have a boutique? It, I'm working on it, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. all right. It's all based off the Country Couture brand. I mean, I wrote the song because the song made sense. It was you know, part, of, part of my life and my, my story. But I thought, oh, I always have always loved fashion. You know, and I just, I want to design so badly and I want to get my ideas out there. So having this Country Couture song as the brand of the, of the fashion line, I was like, no brainer. No brainer. So we're in the we're in the process of, you know, meeting with different designers and and partnering with them and and getting this you know getting a few pieces started, getting rolling, the, get the rollout happening. So, yeah, it's fun. I'm having a good time. So obviously, your mom and your aunt were huge influences early. Sure. But who were some of the other? Shania Chick, Twain. Chicks, oh, Shania. Shania was the the queen. She was it for me. Because yeah. I I see in your stage production some of those things. That, yeah people would see at a Shania sure, show. And sure. she's out there. Oh, yeah. You yeah. just saw her, right? I just saw yeah. her, and I was like, yes, yes, and yeah. I'm like, <laughs> like, but how can I blow that up? How can I, what would I do differently, you know? But no, I, it's all about color. It's all about fun. It's, always, it's all about surprise. It's about pushing the envelope, you know? And uh, I love... Um, I love what what she's done with, with her, obviously her music, but her, her brand, too. It's like, it's it's very eclectic and eccentric in my mm -hmm. opinion and i'm like i'm all for it like fashion high fashion let's go well callytucker.com you mm -hmm. can find the tour dates the resorts world all the different tour dates there in yeah. las vegas that uh, she will be a part of in the days ahead and uh we mentioned earlier we had a world premiere for you and urban cowboy is where we're going next uh, this is a specific, what is the anniversary for Urban Cowboy, the movie? This is a specific year in the history of oh. Urban Cowboy. Oh, I have to look 40 years, up. maybe? Yeah, maybe. I yeah. think they're 40 years. Yeah. I would have died to have John Travolta make a cameo in my oh. music video. Wouldn't that have been something? <laughs> Wouldn't that have been he, something? He is still so cool. He is so yeah. cool. Yeah. I, he was my yeah. first crush, honestly. Oh, I could see that. Yeah, no, yeah. I was a kid. I was yeah. like, you know, what was it? Face off? And I was like. He's so oh, cute. Yeah. I, don't know. I loved him in Pulp, I loved him in Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction, oh, yeah. I yeah. wasn't allowed to watch that, but yes. Well, yeah. we met him on Welcome Back, Cotter. That's where he was introduced. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That far back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. No, he's a, he's a cutie. But Urban Cowboy is about um, it's a it's a modern day fairy tale, and I mean I do live in a little bit of a dream dream world, but I it's it's a story of never giving up on love. Have you? And that goes the for guys. Go ahead. Yeah, no, actually, I have a few more notes on it, and then it's done. So in a few weeks, we're going to premiere that as well. And it's, it's like I said, it's got my mom, it's got my niece in it, my niece Adeline. And um, it's, it's got quite the story behind how the, it was made. And um, it's, I, I say it's a, um, it's a romantic comedy. I don't know if it's the first of its kind, but it's a, it's a music video that is definitely a romantic comedy. So, And as it should be, <laughs> Callie Tucker is premiering that right now all over the world on WSM Radio and CircleCountry.com. Stella Prince at 70. How old are you right now? I just turned 20. <laughs> <laughs> now, if at least 2,000 of you in the audience would stand right now with rousing <laughs> applause will create a moment in your career in France recently. You, you got a yeah. standing ovation to your largest crowd ever? I did, yeah. I've never, ever performed for 2,000 people before, and it was probably the greatest moment of my life so far. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> oh, it was just amazing. Well, when we saw you last, it was Tin Pan South. Yeah, so take right. us back about six months yeah. and recount that as we move forward to the 25th anniversary oh of Americana gosh. Fest. Yeah, I know. These and are you're two... doing an another first yeah. in your career and yeah. in the history of the festival. Yeah, yeah. So Tin Pan South was amazing. It was sold out. It was um, one of the only all-female rounds in the festival this year. It was really special. It was my first ever time doing it. And then um, the summer has been 
touring pretty much nonstop. Um, I've done hu literally hundreds of shows this year, and um, I'm about to do Americana Fest, and I'll be the youngest person ever to perform there. So it's um, it's a real exciting time. <laughs> that's the uh, first ever to host her own free Americana Fest showcase, and it's on September 17th. Mm -hmm. Today is the 4th, so time is going <laughs> short. Yeah. We yes. have a couple of weeks, <laughs> and it'll be at the City Winery. We want to make sure to give the venue yeah. a plug. And sponsored by Change the Conversation. And what's cool about uh, that, those European gig is, I mean, yeah. you truly are have guitar, will travel. Uh, this oh, is a festival yeah. that's used to full bands. <laughs> right. And a singer-songwriter, it's yeah. it's a different vibe. Yeah. And, and they absolutely loved it. But they, yeah. they love songwriters over yeah, there. Yeah, they really do. But it was so nerve-wracking because the festival, the head of the festival, he was like, you know what? We only do bands. Our audience is not going to like you. And then like a week later, <laughs> oh, gosh. and I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. So was, was this a Scotland gig? No, no this France. is in France. It was in France, yeah. okay. And then a week later, he came back to me and he was like, well, I just listened to your music. Would you want to play anyway? And I was like, sure. But yeah, it's it's a lot of like exceptions. You know, they're, they're nice enough to make exceptions mm -hmm. for me. <laughs> I was just thinking about uh, a, a quote I saw on you. It said, imagine the perfect mixture of Joan Baez, Joni Mitchell, and Judy Collins. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Not much... In the way of pressure to live up to there. No pressure at all. Um, no, but honestly, I feel like it's such an honor to be compared to artists like that. Um, it really, it doesn't make me nervous. It just makes me happy. Honestly. Well, they could have stood up in front of a crowd yeah. of people, you know, in a, at a band festival, if you will, mm. and pulled off what yeah. you did. Yeah, it's true. They did. It's interesting. A lot of like the folk singer vibe is just the one person playing, just uh -huh. them and their guitar. And there's well, something. Bob Dylan famously, probably yeah. the most famous yeah. Yeah. example. Mm -hmm. And there's something I just love about that. It's so intimate. It's really special. Yeah, and it's not something ev everybody can do. There mm -hmm. is an art to yeah. sitting there with just you yeah. and, and telling the story. Yeah. And uh, Now, the cool part is you can change the set list anytime you want. Yeah. And if, <laughs> you, if, you, if you feel the vibe is different, you can you can yeah. go different directions. Yeah. I hear Mary Chapin Carpenter, too. I'm a huge Chapin fan. Oh. So so uh, not maybe in the voice, but certainly yeah. in the lyrics and the yeah. playing. These are Chapin songs to me, too. Uh, you know? Her so. and Emmylou Harris. Emmylou is probably mm -hmm. one of my all-time favorites. And... Yeah, there's just some amazing artists that are still touring and still... Oh, yeah. I mean... So who turned you on to that music? Your folks? Well, um, I mean, I grew up with everything growing up. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I had literally everything from Broadway to big bands. So I listened to everything. But then it wasn't really until I got to Nashville that I kind of became obsessed with that kind of music. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. But, I mean... Karen Carpenter is still my all-time number one favorite. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting call. People always get really, they're like, what? It's not Joni Mitchell? And um, yeah, there's just something about her. Like I first heard her music when I was around seven and I've just been obsessed ever since. Well, not too many alto lead singers. Yeah, it's true. And, and there's and just something so, like she has such depth to her. I can't explain it. Did but. it blow your mind when you saw that she played drums too? Oh, like, Because it took gosh. me, a, I, I can't tell you how many years I listened to the Carpenters before I realized. Yeah. Oh, she's a drummer too. <laughs> and <'Cause, you> know, <laughs> from the documentary on them, yeah, a really quality drummer. Oh no, for oh, sure, it wasn't a gimmick. She older, could yeah. play. Oh, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've read every book there is to read, yeah. and I know everything there is, and it's just she blows my mind mm -hmm. constantly. And um, yeah, but I just really, I really respond to these young female artists. I just love learning from them mm -hmm. i feel like every time i read a memoir i learn a life lesson so i read tons of memoirs so uh, to take people back if they don't know your backstory from your first visit to the yeah. show woodstock new york yeah. was home growing up yeah that's right right until recently until recently you like so many others have decided to relocate <laughs> I, know. I did <laughs> and um i know i've been here for over a year and a half now and um I absolutely love it. How tough was that to convince your parents? That, oh, it took a that, lot. It took yeah. like five years of continuous begging <laughs> before they were finally willing to give in. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, for a folk singer, it, yeah. you're in the cradle of folk civilization yeah. in Woodstock, New York. It's true. I it's true. And um, there's something about Nashville, though. It's like it merges so many genres. You uh -huh. know, it's folk and country and a million other things. And it's really music city, period. And yeah. um there's just something so special about being here. Well, the one thing we've had people tell us is that not that you can't write and record great songs anywhere. I mean, the technology certainly exists and your yeah. talent is already there. That's right. But this city makes you up your game. 
It's like doing theater in Manhattan as opposed to doing theater in, you know, Peoria. You know, I mean, you're the same person, but you got to up your game. That's so true. There's like, you know, 60,000 musicians in one city. And Mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, oh, that's so much competition. But to me, it's exciting. You know, where else are you going to find that? And before I get hate mail uh, for the folks in Peoria, that was Bill Cody who said that. Uh, C O D Y. So, okay, no. <laughs> uh, uh, give us a little uh, of the uh, guest list for Americana Fest because I know you had it was yes. Stella and Friends yes. when you did a Tin Pad, and it's kind of the same sort it's of the format. Same with thing, it. yeah. And, and give us a backstory on Change the Conversation as well. Yeah, Change the Conversation is uh, Leslie Fram and Tracy Gershon, and um, it's kind of just an organization that supports and lifts up women in, in country music. And so they sponsor this event, and um, yeah, we have some amazing artists. It's going to be a panel and then a bunch of performances as well, all from women. Um, some of the performers are Twinny, who oh. just played the Opry recently. We yeah, she was just her. with us. I yeah. love uh-huh. Love her. She she's, is. She is easy to love. Mm-hmm. She's what amazing. What a personality and, um, and extraordinarily beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, Brandy Carlisle's niece, who's seventeen and um, is flying out just for this show. She's amazing, Caroline Carlisle. And um, yeah, there's just a bunch of really, mm-hmm. really great up and coming artists. And then uh, you recently played Scotland. Yes, I did. So we talked a little about France. Two weeks ago. So, uh, yeah. what was the venue there? What was it was it? amazing. Um, I did Edinburgh, so mm-hmm. it was the center, capital of everything, and it was really bustling and crowded, um, which was amazing. It was sold out. And then I did two shows in the Isle of Skye, which is like all the way mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere, and it was just total country, and it was really beautiful. Didn't the Beatles famously record there? Well, or uh, one of them lived there? Uh, Isle of Wight, I think, is. Oh, because okay. yeah, you're yeah. thinking because there's a famous festival from from, yes, from back then that's as well. Right. So, well, if you, if if you're old enough to partake in Scotland's most favorite export, you know all these places <laughs> you're talking about. You mean shortbread? Yeah. <laughs> the liquid version of shortbread. <laughs> uh-huh. So I yeah. love this. Yeah, shortbread, <laughs> all butter. All butter, just yeah. only. Yes. it's like yeah. plain butter. Yeah. <laughs> A morning that has given us two world premieres. Uh, that the the latter. Good luck is hard to find. Stella Prince, our special guest. I look forward to having you back soon. <laughs> Thank you for having and me. All the best at Americana Thank Fest. Thank you. September 14th is her date. That's a city winery date and the youngest ever performer to host her own free Americana Fest show. <laughs> Remember that name, Stella Prince <laughs> on Coffee, Country, and Cody.